thank you everyone for uh, attending the session number three, and I think we can get we can get started, and then we we'll see how far we can go before we go for the lunch. So the session number three uh, is for CSR Food Research Institute of Ghana, Iowa State University, Stanford University collaborator presentation. We can go for the second, the second presentation by uh, yeah George, evaluation of hermetic bag technology to preserve shin nuts in rural Ghana. All right, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is George and I'm Jonathan. I'm a PhD student in Iowa State University, and um, I'm here to present on a collaborative work we did here in Ghana on evaluation of hermetic bag technology to preserve shade nuts in rural Ghana. We'll go on. Uh, I'll start my presentation with a little background on the shea industry here in Ghana. Shea nuts are oil bearing crops of African origin, indigenous oil bearing crops here. And uh, for the whole world, it its production is within a thin line within the African continent known as the Sahel region and occupies just about 1% of the total earth surface area. Uh, in Ghana, um, it's estimated to produce about 200 million US dollars as of 2010, be it the exportation of shea nuts or shea butter for pharmaceutical companies, for chocolate industries, and also for cosmetic industries. It is a woman-centered industry, which means women play a major role in its harvesting, in its processing, its storage, and also even the marketing. And uh, across West Africa, it's also estimated that close to 6 million women are actually involved in all these activities that I mentioned. All right, so to give you a little uh, uh, know-how on the status quo of the shape uh, production in rural Ghana, as I indicated, women start. Okay. So on the top picture, you see women actually bringing shea nuts from the wild because it's grows in the wild. They pick them up and travel distances, sometimes over five miles walking and carrying these shea fruits to the household level where they process the fruits into nuts. And once that production is done, they tend to store them basically in inappropriate structures, be it uh, in closets or also in polypropylene bags as shown in the up, uh, top picture. And due to these deficiencies, uh, it leads to high post harvest losses, be it uh, mold infestation and also infestation as shown in the picture. So with this little understanding that we have on the status quo and also as we was witnessed this morning, the viability of hermetic bag technology in Africa, uh, we thought that, well, we can also see how best hermetic bag technology can be used to preserve the quality of shea nuts at the rural production level. So that's what we did. And also um, as one significance of this study, as I'll show as I go on in this presentation, will be the confidence that we give farmers with regards to research like this that we do to also help them in the adoption of this technology. So in our method of evaluation, we work closely with KNUST. As a matter of fact, uh, I work with Joseph and two other undergraduate students to get Shane out from Ulo, which on my poster, you can uh, hit up to me and I'll talk a little bit of the community that we work with. But we got Shea Nuts from Ulo. We stored Shea Nuts on KNUST for 30 weeks. And in our uh, uh, storage, we monitored relative humidity and temperature during the storage period, both in the uh, ambient condition, in the storage facility, and also in all the bags that we work with. Uh, for our study, we considered the use of pigs bags because pigs bags were actually uh, reliably available in the community that we worked with. So using the brand name is not to pr promote anything here, but to show that that's what we used and uh, uh, that was what was available in the community as well. We also considered the normal polypropylene bags, which will be seen as PP bags, and also the jute sack, which is practiced as a 
uh, one of the technologies to store cocoa here. And as a matter of fact, the shea industry is also pushing for the agenda of the use of such bags in storing shea nuts. So uh, for the analysis, we got the shea nuts. We also sand dried them to about 7% moisture content. And we assessed the nuts based on insect damage, insect uh, uh, weight loss due to insect damage, and, uh, and also uh, the concentration of CO2 in the hermetic bags. And indeed, uh, all the data were analyzed for their significant differences. And that's what will be shown in the result. So starting off with the conditions in the ambient and also in the bags, this is a graph that shows the variation of temperature during the storage period. Uh, it was fortunate for us that since we started the storage from uh, November through to July, our storage activity cuts across both the dry season and the wet season uh, in Ghana. So the performance of uh, our system was really in of interest to us. So from the results, you can see that ambient temperature was actually on the rise from the November through to the March, April period, where indeed we experienced the highest temperatures here in Ghana. And uh, it's reduced through to the July period where the rainy season starts. And yes, uh, yeah, indeed, the hermetic bag and all the treatments that were considered were highly affected by the ambient temperature. A similar trend was also found for the relative humidity where ambient conditions also affected the conditions in the bag, as uh, you can see in the, uh, the, uh, the picture on the left or the figure on the left. And on the average, we're recording relative humidity between 72 to 75% in, uh, in, in the bags that were used. So as point of our discussion, we are saying that the high ambient temperature and relative humidity variation in the ambient also has an effect on the, the conditions that we experienced in the bags. And it is also important to also note that the relative humidity condition in the hermetic bag was not varied as much as the other bags due to several factors, such as the property of the material, the property of the nut that is being stored and what have you. Moving on to the moisture content variation during storage, it was also witnessed that indeed the hermetic bag was uh, effective in maintaining the moisture content of the nut as compared to the other treatments, that's the nut stored in the jute sack and also the PP bags. And uh, after the 30 week period, we witnessed that shea nut stored in the hermetic bag varied within one percentage point. So from the 7% that we started with during the dry season where relative humidity was low and temperature were high, the moisture content of the nuts in the hermetic bag reduced to about 6.5% which was not as vast as compared to the nuts stored in the jute sack and the polypropylene bag where the moisture content reduced from the 7% way down to about 5%, which was really intense. Also, when it comes to the percentage of weight loss due to insect damage, and this is actually a factor of uh, the percentage of damaged nuts. So what we did was to use the count and weigh method to determine the percentage of weight loss due to insect damage. But instead of the actual weight of the nuts, we use the dry weight of the nuts to also do away or take away the effects of moisture that also had influence on the weight that we, we use for the experiments. So uh, in the same way, the nuts stored in the hermetic bag had a great potential in reducing the weight at which the nuts were damaged by insects. And however, you know, uh, for the other treatments such as the jute and the PP bags, there were significant differences. In fact, there were high percentage of nuts that were damaged by insects from the onset of this experiment to the 30 week period that we finished our experiment. When it comes to the variation of CO2, due to the properties of the pigs, uh, the polypropylene bag and the jute sack, we didn't take the CO2 concentrations over the storage period because their perforations is almost like the ambient conditions. There's no need for us to do that. So we actually considered our CO2 concentration or determination of CO2 concentration in the pig's bag that we used. And it was interesting to know that at the early stages of 
our experiments, we saw that uh, the concentration of CO2 was about 7%, and it reduced to the 5%, 6% throughout the 30-week period, indicating the uh, reduction in the microbial activities in the bag. Although the other factors, such as the respiration of the nuts, the property of the bags, which as it stands now, there are little information in literature for us to actually confidently determine the reason why we are having that uh, kind of uh, uh, constant CO2 readings for the last few weeks that we carry out the experiment. So to conclude uh, this research, indeed moisture content of shea nuts in hermetic bag varied within less than 1%, which is a good thing for us because in the shea industry, as it stands now, uh, shea is marketed in form of wheat. So if you have an inefficient system, which tend to affect the moisture content of, of, of the nut that you are using, such as the pig's bag being sold in the March, April period, where the weight is reduced due to moisture loss, then it means you have a problem. So, and uh, secondly, to the hermetic bags were also effective in uh, mitigating insect damage, as well as reducing the weight loss due to insect damage. And uh, finally, the CO2 in the hermetic bag dropped below 6% after 12 weeks, indicating the suppress of microbial activities uh, in the bag. Uh, for the final slide, I want to also show the importance of what this consortium has done for myself and my collaborators in terms of providing a conducive environment for me to carry out my study in KNUSD whilst I was away in Ames due to COVID restrictions and we couldn't travel. And also to self-help because after getting the results of this experiment, we teamed up with them to carry out some training in the community that we are working with to train close to over 30 farmers on how to use pig's bag and how to properly store their crops and handle their crops well. And also due to that, as I mentioned in the beginning, we give confidence to the community members in the sense that at least two local entrepreneurs have been set up to distribute pig's bag in the community based on the confidence that they were giving it. And also um, two capstone projects from KNUST students were also achieved through this project. So for more information, you can contact Professor Dekmaya or myself with regards to this project. And also you can follow us on the consortium webpage for more updates. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for your nice presentation, George. Uh, let's a call upon. Uh, Jonathan is going to present on promoting small-scale dried mango chips production in Ghana. Jonathan, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. I am Jonathan Ampa, and the title of my research is uh, Promoting Small-Scale Dried Mango Chips uh, Production in Ghana to Reduce Post-Harvest Loss. There's a slight change with the title on the page and then what is here, but I just roll with me and you wouldn't get lost. So to the order of presentation, I have the introduction. It's a long introduction. The, I will talk about the mango fruit description and then its cultivars. Also the economic importance of mango and then zoom all the way down, talk about the definition of the problem, the main aim, and then the specific objectives. To the economic viability analysis, three things were considered. That is the net present value, the NPV. I also have the benefits cost ratio, the BCR. And then I did a general SWOT analysis as a strength, weakness, opportunities, and threat. And then finally, I have the conclusion and some recommendations. So to the introduction, mango is a tropical fruit and is classified as both a ready to eat crop as well as a cash crop. So there's a nutritional part and then there's also the money-making part. Now, it's a tropical fruit, it's a droop, and then it has a single large seed. It's not every fruit that has a single large seed, but mango has a single large seed surrounded by the fleshy mesocarp. Mango is produced in over 90 countries. Currently, there are over 1,000 varieties. That is why we have all these different shapes, the sizes, the colors that you, you see around. Um, it's the world's largest traded, uh, largest produced as well as traded fruit crop, both in the fresh form as well as the processed form. I think most of us here are used to just chewing it in the fresh form, 
but there's a lot more we can do with mango, as well as the tree and the back itself. Mango has high nutritional content, vitamin A, B, C, uh, phosphorus, potassium, calcium, everything is inside there, it's highly nutritious. And then there's this, um, it's able to slow down the aging process and improves lung function. So probably those who have issues with breathing and all that could also have more access to mango, especially the dried fruit chips. The fruit description is large, it's a freshy group uh, with an edible meso cup. Uh, as I said, there are various uh, shapes, elongate, oblong, over, over it. Uh, also, there are intermediate forms within. The four main cultivars produced in Ghana, that is Kate, Kent, Hayden, and Palmer. Um, out of these four, Kate and Kent actually have the largest population. And there are also other varieties. Um, there is Springfield and there is Amelie as well in the country. But these are the four popular ones, and out of the four, the Kent and the, the, the Kent and the Kate are the most common ones. So this is a picture of showing different mango varieties. And when you hear some of the names, um, Carrie, Fairchild, Guavella, um, Kate, Erwin, Paris, it makes you think you want to give a name to one of your daughters until your wife steps in and tells you, no, you can't name my child after a mango. Uh, so I'll move on to the economic importance of mango. Uh, um, we have confectionaries for sweetening. Some places, they actually slice it and can it, put it in syrup for sale. We have the juice, the puree, the paste, breakfast cereals as well. The, in Cambodia, uh, Thailand, around that area, they actually get, <clears throat> get it into powder and then use it in flavoring fish and meat dishes. So you can see that mango has been used extensively. Even the back is used as a tanning for tanning heights. This uh, photo shows a brief description of the kind of byproducts that we can get from mango. We have the fresh cut slices. If you look at the last uh, row, the dry slices, the pulp, juice, pickle, chutney from the pulp. Yeah, that goes into marmalade and jam and all that. And I know some of us enjoy that. To production, trade, and consumption of mango across the world. This table represents the top 10 countries. And this is, um, I think, as late as May 2021. So it's quite current. India, as usual, is the topmost. And look at the production in tons. It's 2 million. It's a six, seven figure, actually. And then the next is Indonesia, which is 300,000. So what India is producing compared to the next one is about seven to eight times and what Bangladesh can produce. We come down, there's an African representative, we have Egypt in there. And then down to the other countries, there's Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana at th number 35. Now look at the area of Ghana, it's 7,590. We are producing almost 100,000 tons. But compared to Guinea, Cote d'Ivoire, and even Egypt, they, have, uh, they are producing, cultivating much wider area. So comparatively, Ghana stands to gain. Ghana stands to be in a position whereby if we can produce more, cultivate more mango, we can actually get more tons for, for exports and other processing. The total production of mangoes in 2017 was around 50.6 million. And uh, as usual, because India, Indonesia, China are all in Asia, the Asians are on top. And then mango accounted for 25% of all global major exports, with the exception of banana. So that is the citruses, uh, pineapple, and all that. Mango alone is 25%. So this brings out the importance of mango. Also on the production and trade, um, from ITC database, between 2010 and 2014, the importation of mangoes into the EU increased by 69%. And then the total European imports of edible nuts and dried fruits also increased by 13%, reaching 18 billion. I don't know which industry in this country is up to 18 billion. So this is something we need to take a look at. Importance of mango, of drying mango into chips. Now what is drying? Drying is basically reducing the moisture content in the food substance, making it last longer. So when we dry, we are able to prevent growth of microbes. When we dry, we abate uh, spoilage. When we dry, we prevent insect attack. 
when we dry, we are able to uh, extend the shelf life. So by drying, the crop actually becomes firmer and is able to withstand transportation for longer distances. So the definition of the problem, the main issue has to do with post-harvest loss. Now look at the figures, Greater Accra, 25%, Eastern region, 36%, Volta, 33%, who knows what is going on in the North. How, how, I mean, how would you feel if you were to cook rice and at the end of the day, one third of it goes waste? You have access to only two thirds. How would the family survive? So it's important we take a look at reducing post-harvest loss in mango. Increase in the consumption of convenient foods has also come to stay with us. People want something that they can easily, quickly have access to. Also, the declining contribution of agriculture to the GDP of the country is something we need to look at. And by investing in mango production, mango processing, it can, it can all help to uh, increase the impact of agriculture on the GDP of the country. It is based on this promise that research into the economic viability of value addition to mango varieties found in Ghana and the potential effects of improving livelihood was carried out. To the main aim, the main aim was to provide a practical basis for the economic analysis of dry mango chips production, considering its long-term profitability. Now the specific objectives has to do with determining the net present value, the benefits cost ratio, as well as the SWOT analysis. These are basically to give us an idea of profitability of entering into such a venture, producing dried mango chips. To the midst of the presentation, economic feasibility analysis. So um, I have a case study. We have Queen uh, Kwaku Initiative or Queen Organics. They are stationed in Medina and they have been doing this. So I use them as a case study with respect to going through the process of producing mango chips and identifying the major equipment that are needed in producing dried mango chips. It's a Ghanaian company that, with the aim of promoting good health. Um, currently, they are into dried mango, orange, pineapple, and lemon fruits, as well as the dried peels. I'm told the dried peels are used in insecticides. These are some of their products. The net present value is the difference between the present value of an investment cash inflow against the outflow at a designated discount rate. And then the advantage here is that it's able to express all future values in terms of the present. When the NPV is zero, it means that the investment breaks even. So automatically when the NPV is greater than zero, it's positive. It means that the investment is going to be a viable, a viable one. And if it is less than zero, it means that something that will not be profitable. Mathematically, this is how it is expressed. The CT represents the outflow, BT is the inflow and the number of years and then R, the discount rate. The benefits cost ratio uh, is applied to estimate the project work as well as as concerning with analyzing the projects with a viewpoint to achieving maximum net benefits. <laughs> and then mathematically, that is how it is denoted. Um, this is a description of the capital investment that goes in if you want to venture into dried mango chips production. You have to consider buying land, you have to consider building, you have to consider the major equipment as a dryer, a tricycle for distribution, computer, office furniture, and the likes. And these were used in calculating the depreciation for the venture. This also represents the estimated cash flow projections done, done over a period of five years. And at the end of the five years, the calculations uh, brought out the fact that the BCR was greater than one and the NPV was also positive. That's 45,000 Ghana cities. The SWOT analysis. Basically, the strengths were that mango has high nutritional quality. There's the availability of processing equipment. The equipment are actually available on the market to purchase and then use them in processing. There's accessibility to mango fruits. Mango is produced in over five regions of Ghana. And then there's dual seasonality. It's available May, June, July, and also the latter parts of the year. The weaknesses, there's low recovery rates. It's roughly about 15 to 20%. When you put in 100 kilograms into the dryer, you're expecting just 15 to 20 kilograms back. Uh, there's a long drying time, 
high energy requirements and also poor storage. The opportunities, export potential. The project site that I chose was actually in Sawam, which is kind of midway between the high end and the low end. There are real estate around, there are local rural people also around, and it's access, uh, accessible to the airport. There's a population boom, and then there's a health conscious market. These are the threats. Importation of mangoes from neighboring countries, uh, climate change, so we shouldn't rely exclusively on rainfall. The cost of processing equipment, even though the equipment is available, the cost itself is actually higher, and not everybody could afford it. Certification bottlenecks. These are some of the pictures uh, from processing. To the conclusion and recommendations. So at the end of the research, the venture was found to be profitable. The benefit cost ratio was 1.07, implying that for every one CD cost uh, incurred, seven pesos would be a benefit accrued. Also, the net present value uh, was positive, 46,062 CDs. So the recommendations, uh, research could be further conducted on other local mango varieties. Uh, further analysis considering other economic variables such as the internal rate of return and then the break-even analysis. Also for the engineers and scientists, a, cost, a more cost-effective way of alternative drying, which wouldn't have to rely totally on electricity. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I think now we have been told now the lunch is ready. So what I'm suggesting is like now we may stop at this time and then we will come back at 2.15. Period. I'm here to present a, an article titled Detection and Classification of Bruise Severity on Pomegranate Fruit Using a Perspective Image. My supervisors are Prof. Opara, Prof. Perra, and Dr. Sigue. In the course of this presentation, I'll give a brief background to the study, a rundown on the materials and matter, and then I'll briefly discuss the results and the results. So, this study was done on Pomegranate which is uh, undeniably one of the most Asian fruits in the world. It has gained uh, commercial success, especially particularly in South Africa. It is, you know, great, has great demand uh, considering different ways of which can be uh, consumed and then it is a uh, very highly nutritious fruit. This fruit is filled with different quality issues. Some of these include it. Penalty case, you know, sunburn, bruises, you know, different, you know, defect and uh, health uh, quality issues. And these are still prevalent in the industry. Now, particularly bruising, uh, which are caused when the fruit is subjected to excessive uh, uh, stress, digestive force, is actually caused when the fruit in the outer surface ruptures or actually fail without actually rupture. And this leads to quality loss. and Subsequently, it does result to a, large, a huge uh, economic loss. Her perspective imaging is a very unviable uh, technique and is a, uh, you know, it has gained very big progress for a special technology in terms of uh, you know, the food demand and cultural uh, sector. This technique combines spectroscopy as well as imaging to provide high quality. Uh, uh, technique for quality assessment. The data from a spectral imaging is called an hypercube and it's a 3D data. Yes, yeah, it has two pieces, a special data point and then one spectral dimension. This approach has been you know, uh, proposed for detection of different fruit defects and different authors and researchers have worked on a uh, perspective imaging for different uh, fruit uh, uh, items. Now, particularly for pomegranate, this uh, bruising, bruise damage is one of the most common mechanical injury on the fruit. And then, you know, the fruit is also difficult to detect in terms of bruises, considering that the outer uh, shell, which is the, the, the skin or the outer skin uh, uh, surface is tough, and then it is difficult to detect bruises directly. 
currently industry is you know, trained personnel to carry out this you know, group detection, and this system is no longer effective. And it's subjective because then the human beings are making you know, quality decisions. Now, this study is aimed at developing classification models to be able to detect bruised fruits and non compressed food and also quantify the different. Uh, Classify a different severity of grains of pomegranate fruit. Two objectives of this study: first is to be able to distinguish grains from grains fruit. Second is to detect the different fruit severity of grains and then to try to investigate the effect of the different spectral ranges of a non classification model. Materials and method: a uh, total of 90 samples of pomegranate and wonderful cultivars used for this study. Uh, a two, a two different imaging uh, technique that uh, the system is used. One is the linear camera, and then the other one is straight camera. The two different spectral ranges. The linear camera uh, has a range of 100 to 1000 nanometer wide in square, which is sharply different from the spectral range that's indicated. So the drop test is used to submit users on our, uh, on our sample. So these samples are divided into three groups. So, like I said, the first group is the uh, the one dropped at 60 centimeter height. Second group is the uh, bruise impact group at 100 centimeter height. And then the third group is the bruise healthy sample. <laughs> this uh, figure just shows how good uh, the uh, drop height experiment is carried out. You know, uh, first uh, bruise samples uh, placed at a height of 100 and system and dropped and allowed to form surface one and then cut. Then that surface was uh, ensured to have the uh, to, to not hit the ground, attempt to probably mark the point that has been uh, impacted. Okay, this is set up of a uh, perspective imaging system. The two cameras are focused on top of the fruit, and then a sliding so, uh, surface uh, spirit to simulate a uh, typical uh, house operation. This device was, this uh, image was carried, uh, taken out the calf center, food science, uh, food science building, here yeah, instead of a free vesting. Um, so the three uh, product uh, software are useful. This analysis first is the Breeze software, and then the other one is the MP software that MATLAB was used to implement the classification model. So the, the MVs and the Breeze you use used to you know, analyze the image and then to pre-process and then to remove you know the area of region of interest and to, to, to remove noise and unwanted uh, uh, spectral uh, spect Pixels in the, in the image. And then this image was not exported for further analysis. Now, and then the MATLAB, uh, the data, the spectral data that was exported was you know, divided into three training sets, the validation set, and then the test set. And then the, the input was placed as indicated in the paper, 90 samples of data in each three different groups of the return of the input. And then the neural of the, 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 the exhibition image of the set active. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the, the output there was uh, a built a uh, dummy matrix of three, of, uh, three dimensions uh, built to simulate to classify this group as targets into three different outputs. But the first outputs were 16 seconds for the 100 centimeter dropper and then the third ones for the unbridged sample. The PC was also carried out uh, you know, to, 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 to explore the data and then to, to see which components uh, explains percentage of the sample data of interest. And then after the PCL was carried out the samples of the pressure profile was exported, this is the average of the profile. We can see from this figure that uh, uh, the, the spectral profile for the three different groups show distinct uh, profiles of, uh, of the output. Uh, uh, so the results are discussed below. We can see from the table that uh, the, the different uh, you know uh, models developed two different classification accuracy, but both for the training set, the validation set, and then the test set. So this is uh, like a summary of the table of combined uh, model. You can see for group one, group one is a uh, uh, drop height of 60 centimeter. We can see that samples uh, out of the 30 samples that we were used for the study, both for the sewer and the linear. The accuracy was uh, at 3.3 for the sewer and then 90 percent for the linear. For the group two, which is 100 centimeter drop height, the third uh, sewer and the linear performed equally at 93.3% accuracy. 
therefore equal to two, which is uh, the combination of the drop height of 60 and the drop height of 100 centimeter. The accuracy is all of 80 percent, and then 91.7 accuracy. And then we have a compression matches to what uh, I did not matter how the model performed. Uh, as you can see that you know on the, on our right hand side here, of the combined model out of the 30 samples based on each different group, 25. Uh, this part, the first one is for the sway, second one, the B one is for the uh, linear uh, data. Consider that this way, um, 30 samples, 25 I was correctly classified as uh, dropped at 60 centimeter height. Second four was correctly classified as the 100 centimeter bruise, and then only one was classified as uh, uh, to, to have been classified as not uh, as a bruise. Why for the bruise that are out of the 30, 30 of the samples was correctly classified as held uh, bruise. For the average, uh, Classification uh, uh, model here at 88.9 percent for the swear, but then 74.4 percent for the linear data. To summarize, you can see that our model was able to yield up uh, to classify it with crucified uh, accuracy of 96.7 percent. We can also see that you know, uh, the proof of the rate at high for it was high as was at 93.3 percent compared to drop height of 60 centimeters. We can also note that you know how did the how samples you get more accurate compared to the bruise samples. But overall, we can see that the linear spectral yielded better classification accuracy as compared to the sewer spectral range. Now to conclude, this study tries to investigate the detection and classification of bruises of poor dynamic surface using two imaging systems. And we can see that we had a high highest accuracy was achieved at 96 point seven. Using the air and then uh, pattern recognition according to this question, this is the question to the and the sample. We can also see that the combined data had a accuracy of 83.3%, 83 and then 100% respectively for the two different data group, which tells me that the model accuracy increases in the gross event. And then to summarize finally, we see that this story in the foundation for product development. One inline special system using hyperspectral for post detection of provocative input. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great day. Thank, thank you, uh, Emmanuel. Yeah, we're going to proceed with uh, the last presentation for this session before we go for the QA session. Um, Sifmle Owen is, is here around. Uh, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Pumle Njama, and I'm a master's student from the University of Southern Bosch. Uh, today, I'll be presenting a study on the analysis of uh, engineering properties of selected edible coating materials for fresh fruit. Uh, the study is under the supervision of Dr. Tzehe, Professor Barr, and uh, Professor Faul. Uh, just to give you a brief overview uh, on the study, uh, post harvest loss reduction are uh, one of the major constraints that are affecting the quality of fresh fruit uh, during storage. Uh, and so now there is a need to, to actually like improve uh, food security and actually like make more food to be uh, to be available to, to consumers as well as the market by minimizing these losses. Uh, Previous uh, research studies uh, have actually like, discovered that polysaccharide-based biopolymers are the most promising at maintaining the quality of fresh fruits. Uh, in the current time, uh, plastic liners uh, are the mainly post-harvest technology that is used in maintaining uh, the quality of fresh fruit during storage. But now uh, there are problems that are, that, are, that are associated with using uh, plastic liners or synthetic uh, packaging material uh, and one and uh, just to name uh, a few of those uh, problems or challenges is uh, is that uh, plastics are, are very harmful to the environment they can cause like uh, pollutions and also these and also the high costs that are very, uh, that are that are involved when it comes to recycling uh, plastics uh, so now this poses a question to researchers out there as to how can all of this be, be avoided. Uh, so now 
um, is uh, is previous is previous stated that um, biopolymers um, are becoming a promising uh, approach or option to 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 uh, to package foods instead of using the normal plastic liners. And uh, previous studies uh, have uh, have reported that gamma rapid as well as starch based coatings have reduced weight loss in wonderful pomegranates during uh, storage and uh, during 42 days of cold storage and also five days in ambient temperature. Uh, but however, it is very important to, to, to not only start the application of these edible recordings and look at their response, but also start as well as understand the compatibility of properties of these biopolymers. So therefore, there is a need now to assess the film as well as the coating properties. As, uh, as they have not been directly studied. So this study uh, focuses mainly on assessing the film and well, uh, as well as the coating properties of, uh, of, these, uh, of these biodegradable uh, biopolymer. Uh, the aim and objectives are uh, the aim of the study is to prepare as well as characterize the properties of the selected uh, edible film uh, from different uh, formulations. And the specific objective are uh, to measure as well as characterize the mechanical properties that include the, the tensile strength as well as the young modulus of the selected biopolymers. And the two biopolymers that, uh, that are used in the study is uh, metacellulose as well as chitosan biopolymer. And this is the preparation process of the edible films. Uh, two different biopolymers uh, were used, uh, that is uh, chitosan and metacellulose uh, at three different temperatures. Uh, for both biopolymers, 0 0.5, 1, and also 1.5. And the, uh, and, the, uh, and the biopolymers will dissolve in distilled water with the addition of a glycerol uh, to form a coating solution. And also uh, the, uh, uh, the coating solution was casted in a petri dish and dried in an oven at 40 degrees Celsius to, to form a film as demonstrated uh, in the film. Uh, detaching process. And the materials and methods, uh, elastic uh, modulus, also known as young modulus, which is demonstrated by the Kepleta Y, and also the tensile strength, which is, which is demonstrated uh, by the Badenelas TS, were measured using the MTS criterion model, and also the following equation we used to calculate the two properties, which is TS, which is the tensile strength was force over area, and also for the young modulus was the force divided by area as well as change in length of the, of the film. And uh, figure one demonstrates uh, the mechanical testing uh, procedure. Uh, statistical analysis, uh, a, a completely randomized design was used to study, uh, uh, was, was used in the study and this treatment was, was replicated three times. And the treatments included uh, three concentrations for each of the different polymers, and the step was carried out uh, using uh, the size enterprise guideline. And then coming to the results and discussion, uh, the concentration which ranged uh, from 0 0.5 did not show any significant effects, and also from the graph, uh, from the first, um, from figure two graph for chance strength, uh, graph A, represents the metacellular polymer and graph B uh, uh, represent the chitosan polymer. And there was no change in, in strength from the three different uh, concentrations in, in tensile strength for, for the metacellular polymer for the metacellulose polymer. And also there were and also there was a change in concentrate as you increase the concentrations of the chitosan polymer. Uh, the higher concentration, uh, the higher concentration demonstrated higher strength as compared to the two other strength. Uh, the tensile strength uh, property of the film demonstrates how strong the film is uh, in terms of it being a packaging material, uh, and also in terms of tensile strength, uh, the higher concentration of the chitosan sign film showed to be the strongest out of the other concentration that we used to prepare the films. And then coming to the young modulus property, this demonstrates how stiff uh, the prepared edible film is. And, uh, the, and uh, from this and from the young modulus, uh, the 0 0.5 uh, concentration uh, of amethyst are shown to be the, 
the stiffest as compared to the both other polymers. Uh, and in conclusion, uh, both polymers with retitocine and also metacellulose are uh, shown to be good film, uh, showed good film forming properties. Because this one about what I also have observed from the experiment is not all edible uh, biopolymers can form film. And these two out of the others that we prepared were not uh, uh, successful in forming the films. So these two are uh, biopolymers. I uh, showed good film forming properties as compared to other polymers that was tested in the in the study. And also the kytosine film exhibited uh, acceptable mechanical properties, which actually showed high tensile strength, as well as, uh, as as well as your as well as low yang modulus. And uh, this kytosine and the kytosine in the concentration for in the high concentration for the kytosine film, which exhibited these acceptable mechanical properties. Uh, can be further optimized for post harvest uh, application. Uh, this study uh, is part uh, is part uh, forms part of the research uh, of, of of my master's research project, and this is one of the experimental trials that I've conducted for for this experiment. So future work is still needs to be conducted in order to finish the project and uh, the future work and some of the experimental work that I'm yet to to finish. I include the determination uh, of the additional film properties that include the thickness, the moisture permeability, and the gas permeability. And the two cases that I'm going to measure for permeability property is uh, include the oxygen as well as carbon dioxide. And also another object, uh, objective that I'm going to look at is the correlation of the prepared films with the coating efficacy for of quality of food quality keeping. And that's the end of the presentation. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Owen. Thank you for the next presentation. Uh, for the Q and A session, I'd like to call upon uh, Jonathan and then George for just to come in here for any question that you have. For those who are online, please, if you have any question, raise your hand and then unmute and then ask your question. So yeah, thank you. Uh, I will start with uh, Jonathan. I have a question. So with your presentation. Uh, in your model, like now you are assuming so that now uh, these um, dried mango chips will be consumed. But I'm people are more familiar with the, the mango, the entire fruits or in the juice. So I have not seen your presentation where you assess the acceptability. So are they go people to accept that? So because in your model, like you're assuming that people will be consuming this, but if the acceptability is low, how are we going to address that? So yeah, thank you. All right, um, acceptability was not conducted. That is true. But uh, part of the research was also focused on the export potential. And that one has already been assessed and there are reports from the CBI in Netherlands that support the fact that mango, dried mango chips, pineapple chips, popo, are actually a hot cake in European countries. So yeah, that is the other aspect to tap into that export uh, potential market. Jonathan, can you tell us more about the institute that you represent? Is that a government institute, private institute? What, what, what is it? Yeah, I work with the CSIR, that's the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research precisely the Food Research Institute. There are 13 institutes. There is Water Research Institute, Soil Research, Plant Genetic, Savannah Agriculture, plenty. But I'm with the Food Research Institute and I'm the head of the engineering section at the Food Research Institute. Basically everything about food processing, product development, engineering, machinery, fabrication, construction, uh, acceptability tests, nutritional analysis, chemical microbial. We have the SANAS accredited laboratories to carry out all those kinds of chemical analysis. Yeah, so it's a government institute. Food research is in Accra at Shiashi, um, quite close to the University of Ghana, Legon. Yeah. Uh, any other question from that one? Hi, George. Um, the, the bag that you um, 
that you're working on in terms of uh, um, the uh, preservation of the shear uh, knots, is it the knots, right? So uh, from the financial viewpoint, do you think there are alternative, given the cost of, of the bags, do you think there could be alternative, uh, cheap alternative to, to the bag? So if I understand your question rightfully, other storage alternatives other than using the hermetic bags? In the, in the, yeah, in the, in the interest of uh, the fungi, the, it's deterioration, right? Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. So are there other alternatives instead of the bags? Yeah. Okay. So uh, thanks for the question. No. So for the storage of shade knots, indeed, they are, they, when it comes to bags per se, there's the polypropylene, the hermetic, and the jute which are all good. But if you just look at the cost as being the hindrance of the economic viability, then that may not be a viable option. But looking at it in its usage, not just one harvesting season, but let's say five or six harvesting seasons, which is possible, then you can also see that using the hermetic bag could be a potential for uh, storing shade nuts. But when it comes to other alternatives like the polypropylene, which is relatively cheap as an initial cost, that also comes with its own challenges, which leads to high losses as was presented in my case. Yes. Yes. So, so the decay is a problem, is a major problem, right? Yes. Because I, in the picture you showed this, there was a lot of fungi uh, growth. So uh, that's, one could say or argue that it's as a result of the storage environment, maybe high relative humidity, or it could even be transfer of, uh, I mean, from the source, contamination from the source. Do you think, because someone was saying in South Africa that uh, you, you offering this high technology and all that expensive one, just simple, simply uh, instructing people to handle the produce, you know, the, the handling process alone is enough to actually get through, well, minimize the problem. Uh, did you look at the handling and, uh, you know, the, the integrity of the, the microbial, the microbial integrity of, of, of the handling process? Thank you. All right. So to start from the microbial part, we didn't look at the microbial load and all those things. But as you rightfully said, when it comes to the handling, yes, we know as part of our work, we know that drying, appropriate drying of it is also important in terms of keeping the moisture content of the nut at a safe storage moisture content first before you store the nuts in the hermetic bag. So indeed, their practices also play a role. And that's what is shown on my poster there. And that's what also informed us that if this research is good or the hermetic bag is showing some viable means of storing the nuts, there's also the need for us to train the farmers on how to dry them using even simple tarpaulins, right? And also using the hermetic bag to also uh, help in keeping the nuts for quite a long time. Uh, there is uh, one question online. Emmanuel, can you unmute and then ask your question? Uh, my question goes to Jonathan. Jonathan, who did uh, dried mango. My question is: um, Do you did you do any pre-treatments before drying? And if any, what were the pre-treatments? Um, my then the second question is: um, In Kenya, uh, we dried uh, different varieties of mango, and uh, there is uh, some specific varieties that give uh, best results in dried mango. Is this the same case in? Um, in your study or any variety that you mentioned in your presentation gives the same results. Thank you. Okay. Um, with respect to the pre-treatments, two major pre-treatments were carried out. One had to do with blanching after peeling and slicing. And then the other one was treatment with sodium metabisulfite at 0.1%. So this helped to the blanching helped to increase the drying rate, and then the sodium metabisulfite helped to keep the color, and then the physical, some of the physical properties. And then I think he mentioned um, specific varieties. 
for drying. <laughs> yeah, so over here, from my research, out of the four varieties, uh, even though it wasn't part of my current presentation, but out of the four, the Palmer and the Hayden dried fastest, even though their initial moisture content was the highest compared to Kent and Kate's varieties. And then um, the color output. Kent and Palmer had the best color output with respect to color red and yellow. Of course, it's mango, so we are not going to consider blue and the others. The uh, consideration focuses on red and yellow. So basically, that is it with respect to color and then their physical output. Thank you, Mark. If you allow me two questions, one for each person. Uh, George, uh, you did a destructive sampling. Uh, yeah, you did a destructive sampling uh, in your drying experiment, uh, in your storage experiment. At six, you stored it for 30 weeks. At six, 12 weeks, 21 weeks. In 30 weeks. I was wondering why you didn't do it at equal interval. 6, 12, 18, 24, 30. Why? That's my question. Then let me ask the second one. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, Prof. Thank you. And thank you for the clear observation in that. Indeed, what's happened was since I said we did a study here on Cairn University campus, during the time where we were supposed to take the, uh, the third sampling stage, which was the 18 week, as you said, there were no students on campus. So, and I wasn't here too. So due to that, we decided to shift the uh, sampling period after two weeks, which led to the uh, 21 week period. And we had the opportunity to still continue with our six week sampling intervals, but we decided that since one sampling period took nine weeks. We decided to take the last one after nine weeks too, so that in any case, we'll do away with certain biases that could be anticipated in the state. Very well. Uh, to Jonathan, uh, your benefits cost ratio is 1.07. Is that something you can convince someone to invest in for every CD? invested, you only get seven persons. Can you really convince someone to do that? Okay, thank you. Um, the benefits cost ratio is only one of the economic parameters. Then there was the NPV, which gave us 45,000 cities. Now the table, I don't know whether she can pull it up, but in calculating the BCR in the table, I used a 20% discounted rates. This is actually um, kind of harsh or intentional because we are looking at a situation whereby if you have, assuming you have 100,000 cities, you could as well sit in your hall and then buy treasury bills at 14 or 15% and still be able to make some money. But I have discounted my goods by 20% and I'm still making that 45,000 uh, NPV which is more or less like a profit. So this goes on to buttress the fact that putting your 100,000 cities into the mango chase business is far more profitable than buying treasury bills at 14%. What if I did not even discount at 20%? I would have made much more. But because you don't know what would happen, it's economics, it may go bad, something could happen. So I discounted 20% downwards. Yeah, we had a, just a, a question here on the chat for uh, uh, Jonathan uh, from the same person. What variety of mango is used for exported mango chips and what mango sli slice size did you use? All right, so currently the concentration is on Kent <clears throat> and Kate, but from research, Palmer and Hayden also have potential, especially the Palmer with respect to the physical color output. And then, sorry, the second one. The slice size is um, six millimeters, six mm thickness. 
the, it's a square. I cut them into squares of um, one, 1 1.5 inch square. Yes. So, so sorry, so that is a four, 40 mm on each side. Yes. Yes. Yes, gentlemen, you know who on the share not. Um, I have a question on the hemetic bags. Um, I, I wonder whether you did a basic pre storage activity before the work. Because if you did, I don't know how if you'll be able to explain. You said <clears throat> relative humidity in the hemetic bags was higher, but the infestation too was high. So, could you explain how that happened? Please, can you help me understand the pre-storage activities? Like which one are you considering? I suppose our scientists, you have, <laughs> when you have the produce, you clean them before you store. Exactly. Have it in, have it okay. out. Uh, so, so if you, if you clean, <laughs> make sure that you store good produce, definitely there will be infestation. Okay, so actually what's happened is before we stored, yes. since sourcing sheen out in the uh, community, you, do, you can't get the whole seven tons that, uh, no, close to seven tons that we use from one farmer, we sourced from different farmers in the community that we're dealing with. And all came at different moisture content, different infestation levels and what have you. So when we brought them to KNUST campus, first we washed them, and which means that the moisture content will vary in any way. And after washing them, we had to dry them to the 7% moisture content as recommended for the sale of shea nuts here in Ghana. And before the storage to we determined the moisture content and insect infestation prior to storage. And so we know all the baseline information, all the characteristics of our nuts before we kept them in our bags for 30 weeks. So then, how did the infestation come about during the increase in the relative humidity of bags? How did that happen? So, uh, Okay, so taking it off from your second question, which is on the relative humidity, uh, the weather has an influence in the microclimatic conditions in all the bags because of the property of all the bags that we used. Secondly, to due to the temperature, you have variation in the moisture content of the nut or the vapor pressure in the bags, which also influences relative humidity in the bag. So, all these factors are things that could potentially affect the relative humidity in the bag. But considering the, uh, the hermetic bag, due to the property of the liners that is present, the water vapor transpiration rate, you could also see that there's a restrictions to the amount of vapor that goes out of the bag. And in that way, it is able to keep it within uh, not a high varying relative humidity as compared to the other bags, though we realized that the ambient condition was varying between, I think, 69% relative humidity to 75% relative humidity. And for the insect infestation, if uh, we can remember the temperature within during the storage period and the relative humidity during the storage period were highly conducive for insect multiplication. So indeed, we're expecting the infestation in the bags to be really high, but it was really suppressed in the hermetic bag due to the uh, conditions that were created in that uh, due to its property. So yes, that's why we have those values and that's why I presented it as such. Uh, well, we, we have the last question before we move to the next session. We can keep now discussing this after doing that. So yeah. Uh, Jonathan, are there any um, mango processing centers around Ghana which may benefit from the output of your work? Okay. Aside the case study I used of Kwaku Initiative at Medina, I know that there are other fruits processing companies within Accra up to towards Pokwase and Sao. Um, some of them are not currently working on mango, but they have the potential to easily substitute their orange, lime, lemon slices for mango slices. So that potential exists. 
and uh, probably the AGI or one of those will be the best place to get this list of private companies that can benefit fully from this research. Yeah, thank you for your all presenters. Uh, let's move to the next session that we're going to be chaired with. Uh, yeah, thank you.